good place probably to start um, with is is just to kind of um, get an introduction from yourself um, about you, your role, um, your experience. As I mentioned in the welcome notes, you've you've moved from uh, the private sector to the public sector since we um, last spoke anyway. So uh, if you could just uh, fill in the audience on, on kind of who you are and what you're about. Sure, absolutely. So uh, I've been in the software industry for 30 years now. The first 20 years as a software developer um, and the last 10 years as someone managing software delivery. Um, I've worked in lots and lots of different sectors. So uh, radar systems, satellite systems. Um, I worked on the Heathrow Rail Express software. Mm -hmm. um, finance systems, I've worked for Sky, uh, as you say, I'm now in the public sector. Um, and I really quite like changing sectors and sort of learning what's great about a sector. Yeah. And also those things that um, some of the other sectors already do really easily. And there's always things that a particular sector does really, really well, mm -hmm. that doesn't often get moved between. So, so I really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. um, my current role is um, working in the courts and tribunal service. I, um, I'm working on a massive digital transformation there. And one of the big things I'm doing right now is building an internal software delivery capability uh, from nothing. Literally mm -hmm. before I joined, there was nobody internally who was technical um, in a software respect um, through to, we expect around 250 in the end. Gosh. So a big change for you and a, and a big challenge ahead. Um, but I think it's, I've, I mean, I've read, uh, you know, some things about it. It's, it's in the media and it's, you know, uh, it, with the HMCTS, it looks like it's going through a huge transformation period. So uh, quite an exciting period for you. Um, and and it's, it's great to, you know, feel that you're involved with that. Now, over the course of um, the pandemic, um, and it might be slightly different for HMCTS because obviously that transformation was going to happen. Um, but it's kind of accelerated digital transformation um, across organisations, um, both private sector and, of course, um, public sector, which you know has had a massive change over the last 12 months, 16 months now. Um, um, but many have kind of seen that pandemic as an opportunity to jumpstart digital transformation. Um, you know, we've seen over the last year, uh, I think I've seen it over a dozen times, more than a dozen times, the, the LinkedIn meme that says, what started your digital transformation? And it's got some tick boxes and the COVID-19 is ticked. And I think it's it's kind of true for, for a lot of organizations that it really has kickstarted that. But how has digital transformation changed or, or, or evolved for you over the last 12 months? Yeah, I mean, I guess a lot of digital transformations haven't so much been chosen to start over this period as there's been no choice. You know, you've, you've got to do something. Yeah. Um, and I think it's probably a combination of the two within my organisation. So we have um, the digital transformation already underway. So so that has continued. That hasn't paused yeah. um, with this. But also... Um, but some of the uptake and some of the engagement with the people that we're trying to provide some of these services for has changed. Yeah. The most stark example of that is uh, video hearings, yeah. which was quite hard to get people to want to use pre-pandemic. And now the use of it is through the roof. And, you know, our problem now is the other side of these things were not designed to have this amount of use. So making sure that the design evolves or not designed at that moment. Obviously, it's scalable, but we have to scale it and, and make sure that that happens in a safe and appropriate way. Mm -hmm. So the demand suddenly from people for that transformation has been huge, which has really helped push forward. Mm -hmm. um, but also on the other side of things, you know, the thousands of laptops, not me personally, because I'm on the software side, but my colleagues, have suddenly had to provide to staff across the country the um, the just taking stuff from the back of courts yeah. from, from offices within courtrooms and suddenly having them at home and they've never been at home before. So the amount of uh, guidance again that my colleagues has had have had to send out to them and and yeah. ways of working and changes <clears throat> and also if I bring it a bit more closer to home with my team. Um, 
My plan when I joined the organization was to open five digital hubs around the country. Yeah. Um, bring in digital staff outside of London, really build uh, this 250 person team. Um, and we will now be having far fewer hubs, yeah. far more working from home going forward. So even just looking at ways of working going forward, um, <clears throat> excuse me, has completely changed. So, you know, lots and lots of different levels. And I think that's probably true for all organisations everywhere. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the the I've spoken to obviously through these events quite a lot, of, you know, different industries and different um, digital executives and, and everyone echoes that same kind of sentiment that that's how much their strategy has changed, evolved and um, even mid pandemic and even now, obviously everything changes on a constant so the strategy changes and the planning changes um as the uncertainty moves to be you know a bit more certainty there's there's kind of that light at the end of the tunnel and that strategy becomes a bit clearer but until we're kind of fully out of this we we don't really know um, where we'll be as organizations in the, in the full sense um, just due to that uncertainty so it's really interesting to hear how um, each you know of these individuals has had to rewrite and you know rip up um, strategy in the rule book so to speak um so with the changes and development across business and public sector transformation you, you've mentioned a few of the challenges there but what what have you seen potentially is the biggest challenge um to you and to your organization do you think um i th i think the biggest one probably is the one that i mentioned around yeah. Um, these services that are suddenly being used in a far more extensive way sure. than they were configured to be used. And you can imagine, you know, a, a remote uh, court case, you don't really want the video or the sound not working yeah. or the, uh, you know, the video breaking partway through or someone not being able to get in. It's really mm. important for access to justice mm. um and so you can understand if anything is happening with that 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 gets huge attention in the organization but i think also effectively it has become now truly a primary channel for the business it's no longer um in those organizations where it was a an enabling um underneath type part of the organization it no longer is it's been far more pushed to that front primary channel route and that means that people who've worked in that more traditional it environment need to change their thinking mm -hmm. and take that in and through to much more a frontline type thinking mm -hmm. um, and i think that hasn't happened universally as yet yeah and then when when you've spoken with us in the past, uh, I mentioned at the start that you'd spoken at uh, our Manchester event and our, our London event when, you know, uh, in-person events were such a thing. Um, and you've been, as mentioned again, a huge advocate of agile practice. Uh, and you, you did share some you know brilliant insights with our audiences. How has Agile kind of had to adapt given the changes in the ways of working? I know you mentioned again at the start about, um, you know, the number of devices that had to be distributed um, to, to workers. And, and, you know, obviously that requires a certain type of leadership. Has Agile helped and, and has that evolved as, as, as things changed on that front? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, Agile is primarily a mindset. Yeah. anyway so yeah. you know um obviously that that same mindset is there around um <clears throat> empowering people to get out there and solve these problems mm. um if i look more at, at software delivery rather than the organization as a whole mm. and i look at traditional agile which i'm smiling at myself for even saying but traditional agile approaches um and compare that to today, I think probably, you know, much of it's the same, much of that same sort of the the, the team working together, cross-functional, um, everyone having that equal voice, and, and lots of tools have suddenly sprung up, or at least have sprung into my attention, which I was less aware of before, which enables some of those uh, things that we used to do face-to-face. -face. Mm. And... Um, you know, I can't help but think if this pandemic had happened 20 years ago, 
we could not have worked from home in this sector, in this in this type of thing. It just would not have been possible. Yeah. All of these tools that are available today, it's it's quite shocking, really, and how they've been pushed forward. But I think, you know, the biggest challenges to traditional agile ways of working for me have been onboarding. Yeah. I have I have never met my boss. He started the first day of lockdown one. I have never met any of the people that I've recruited into my area since I started, um, which as of today, I think is 34 people. Um, And none of that recruitment has been face to face. So, you know, there's new uh, things. How do you onboard people? Everyone's met that type of problem. But I'm particularly concerned, I think, around... um, around more junior staff and that accidental mentoring that happens when you happen to sit next to someone Mm -hmm. and you overhear something or you ask a question and it leads to something more. That's, I think, a real challenge. And as we start to get a little bit more back to normal, for me, the main thing is to be able to get face to face with some of the people, get some workshop type things happening Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I worked um, many years ago, well, gosh, probably about 20 years ago now um, in the US and uh, I set up a team in China and my client was in the UK and for visa reasons, I renewed my visa, but if I left, I'd have to go through lots of questions to get back in again. So I couldn't go and see either my client Mm -hmm. or my team. Mm And I had to do everything remotely and we didn't have lots of the tools. Yeah. And it kind of makes me think about that time and how we had to go back to basics, use email, really think about our communications really properly. And I think we're back in that sort of space now, really properly think about how we're talking to people, make sure everyone's involved yeah. in a way that in a room that's easier to do. Yeah, and and just quickly on that, you you obviously say you've never you've never met your boss, and you've um, recruited thirty three people. Was it, was it thirty three? You said thirty four, I think. Thirty four people within the organisation. How do you and, and can you maybe kind of pass on that culture through remote working? Is it possible? Can you kind of instill um, you know your work culture, whatever that might be? Obviously culture of inf- innovation is, is the kind of the go-to at the moment. How do you kind of pass that over? Can you do it? Is it possible? Um, you know I think in a way because of what I'm doing it's slightly easier. So I'm building a brand new software delivery capability. Hmm. So it isn't that there's an existing culture. Sure. Okay. It's that we're we're trying to create a culture. Okay. Um, now there is an existing culture, obviously within the organisation and within the directorate, yeah. um, which has some really great values that we try and instill in through. Um, but what we've been doing around culture is being really explicit about it. So. Mm-hmm. The first few people who started, who report directly into me, we had an online workshop just purely around who we are, how we want to work, who we want to be. And we gathered that together, Mm -hmm. formed um, a graphic around it. Mm -hmm. That's part of the onboarding for everyone who starts. Mm -hmm. Everyone who starts gets uh, time in the calendar with me to have that conversation about why I joined the organisation what I'm passionate about, for me to learn more about them, um, and for us to talk a bit about culture and what we want to do going forward and the fact this is an exciting time and what the plans are, Mm -hmm. um, to really try and set that vision. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's all about the two-way communications, the um, reaching out to people. I think that's super important. No, nice answer. We've just had a question coming from the audience. I think, I think it's a really good question as well. So I want to put this to you. Um, and thank you to Declan for the for the question. For some of the digital transformation that's had to happen in response to mass working at home, how much of this has long term future compared to being a more temporary process? Um, so the, you know the processes that are in place now. Are we going to see long term value in them, or, or are they just a thing of the time? Do you think? I think my concern is people might be viewing it mm-hmm. as temporary. Yeah. And I think f- for me, that's a big concern. You know, I'm based in Yorkshire. Mm-hmm. Most of the people in my organisation when I started are based in London. Of course, yeah. 
Uh, by the time I've finished in my directorate, most people will not be based in London because yeah. I'm employing lots of people outside of London, mm -hmm. um, as well as a few in London. Um, but um, when I first started, I had a team that reported into me who are based in Northampton, mm -hmm. who felt very out of it when there was a stand up for the whole directorate held in London, streamed there various technical reasons they couldn't really properly involve themselves they could kind of hear hear it sort of whereas today it feels far more equal everyone gets the same bandwidth of communication um, they get to be able to ask questions in the same way as anybody else and I am really because I'm in Yorkshire and I'm in the leadership team I'm able to very clearly say we cannot go back to those things in London yeah. where where most people or at least a good chunk of people don't feel as involved you know yeah. we need to keep this out and and um also um I talked earlier about we were I was going to set up five hubs across the UK I'm now setting up two mm -hmm. uh one in Salford one in Birmingham and um everybody else who doesn't live near those is going to be working remotely Sure. Um, and that's going to be their norm. So we will get them together mm -hmm. every so often, yeah. but their norm is going to be to work, rem work remotely. Mm -hmm. And you've got to, you know, that flexibility around where people can work. I've loved not having to travel as much. Yeah. I've actually seen much more of my husband, which for me is a good thing, not yeah. maybe for everybody. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, that time that I'm not traveling, all of those things I've really loved. Now, mm. I really want, you get two sides of the same coin. Some people really yeah. want to get back in front of people. Yeah. I feel like I'm really in front of people as when I sit like this. So yeah. for me, the experience, it is a little different, but it's not vastly different. For yeah. some people it is, and they want to get back in the office. Yeah. But for other people, the benefits of working remotely, and I think people who insist that people go back in the office five days, I mean, I. I've not even heard of that from anybody. No. But people who insist that people go back in three days, those people are going to find other opportunities if they'd rather work from home most of the time. True. Yeah. You've really got to be thinking about um, your staff and their preference. Mm -hmm. In a way, the organisation I work for today has huge benefits because it is it does have courts or offices near nearly everybody in the country yeah so if they want to work remotely but they don't want to work at home mm. it actually has that almost unique uh, ability to say we'll go work in 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 the offices at this court then yeah so you know you've got to look for those sorts of benefits and yeah. really make the most of them where you have really candidate driven recruitment such as within the digital arena mm. you've got to think about your staff you are in competition with all of those other organizations yeah. um the sexy organizations the um, organizations are offer complete flexibility around location around working hours yeah. around fitting things around people's actual lives those are the people who will retain their staff and who will take your staff if you're not in that space yeah no that's a really good answer and i think you, you know you're, you're very right i think hybrid working and offering that remote um approach is is, is going to be the way forwards so i think when you look at kind of organizations we name names but you know the big management consultancy firms you know when they start rolling out um a remote working approach that you know that's probably going to be the trend set um because uh, i think we all know that they like to have workers in the office and or traditionally have had had, had, had that in place so it'll be interesting to see what happens but i think getting that work-life balance right is is going to be so much more important for for employees and employers so it'd be interesting i think if we and can look at any silver lining of the pandemic it might be those new ways of working perhaps and i think it's pushed forward uh, a higher level management's understanding of exactly, what people yeah. will do i no longer have to fight the fight of mm -hmm. can someone work from home will they do sure. work yeah. that's no longer part of the conversation yeah I mean, I, I believe I've leapt forward probably a decade yeah. in my ability to deal with my senior management yeah. around the risks of, of setting up a remote workforce, for example. 
Yeah, well, it's been proof of concept, hasn't it? And it's largely worked. We're seeing more product, productive workforces and um, and everything. So it's it's good. It's good in in many regards um, for a lot of people. But obviously, like you said, a lot of people also like that day to day office kind of. And I think it's about offering people that choice. Yes, exactly. Um, but also, you know, we will definitely be holding regular events every few months where we get everybody together once we're in a world where we can do that yeah. um and because that face-to-face -face time when i did work remotely uh with china um and i couldn't meet them for the first six months that i worked with them and it worked really well mm. but the second i went to see them it worked amazingly well yeah. there's just something inherently human in that ability to get a little bit of face-to-face -face time yeah no that's really good. Um, that was a good question. It sparked some good conversation there. So thanks, Declan. Um, now, I often read about um, digital transformation failure rates, um, which apparently are quite high. How how that's measured in, in, in a lot of circumstances, I'm not so sure, um, because it's a, it's a very much an ongoing process. There's no like end goal. There's no project complete. We've done the digital transformation. It, it doesn't work like that. But failure rates are, are, are considered high. Uh, and, and like I say, often well referenced what in your opinion um, is the most important thing to get right um, with successful or, or effective transformation and, and um, maybe failures you know not a bad thing in some some instances but um, we obviously like more um, success over failure so what what do you think of is you know what's the makeup for successful transformation it's, it's interesting you say that so one of the things I talk to my teams a lot about is celebrating failures yeah. when they happen because mm -hmm. the learning opportunity is huge mm -hmm. um, but I think actually probably the main things are apply agile concepts to your transformation and it's amazing how many transformations are waterfall even when they're trying to move to a more agile world. It's mm. very interesting. Um, so for me, I would keep probably a few things. One is outcome driven. Every single thing you're doing should be driving towards your outcomes. What often happens is the outcomes are thought about, a big business case is put together for the transformation. And then it becomes about delivering the things that are on the list. Mm -hmm. And we're no longer, and then later on, it tries to get tied back to the outcomes. Yeah. You need to be outcome driven, utterly know what outcome you're trying to achieve with this thing and keep asking that question. How is this helping us get into there? Mm -hmm. um, but also small chunks, iterative. Um, if you decide to stop your agile transformation, let's say after nine months, you ought to have visceral improvements that have been put in place, many different ones during those nine months that you get to keep. So if you choose not to um, implement anything more, you've had benefit from what you've done so far. Yeah. And too many transformations, because so many of them are quite waterfall in nature, might be part way through that transformation and you get nothing out of it if you, if you stop at that point. And that iterative nature also allows you to be outcome driven because you can see true actual outcomes as you go. So mm -hmm. these all really tie together mm. and then I think one of the big things I see missing from a number of transformations is that view of end to end um, and that sounds silly because we're using the word transformation it's big it's wide but quite often I'll see for example a software service um, and they will look at the legacy systems they'll replace those they'll make it more digital mm -hmm. But what they're not actually doing is looking end to end. How much post is received? How many emails are received? Do you get thousands of emails a week? That's still digital. Yeah. So everyone thinks, oh, it's still digital, blah. But actually, the amount of work involved with that, and there's probably other better ways that, that you can more quickly serve your customers mm. than, than having all these emails that are unstructured and that you've got to do something with and have humans sit and read. Yeah. So really properly looking end to end rather than just trying to replace the system. Yes, yeah, that's a really good answer. And then with Agile approach uh, methodology, um, what would you say to um, you know a leader or, or someone that's, thinking about, you know, that doesn't have it in place, that's thinking of taking that approach and, and making that part of their organisation, what would you kind of say to, to, you know, encourage them along that road? 
I think uh, it, I would say a few things. It's really about mindset and it's not about methodology. Sure. And um, there are many people out there who will sell methodologies. Yeah. And I mean, not sell financially, but will sell this is it only way to do it scrum has become the de facto only way to do agile and it really isn't there's many many different ways mm -hmm. and knowing those different approaches means you can be more flexible for different teams with different sorts of work mm -hmm. and flexibility trying to make everybody work in exactly the same way mm -hmm. you lose huge amounts of the benefit of agile and its adaptability to the actual team that's working in that space mm -hmm. um I'm not a big believer in scaled agile uh, approaches because I think they might be great where you truly have a scaled agile problem. If you have a lot of agile people, that's not a scaled agile problem. Mm -hmm. If they're all owning their own separate services and they just have a few dependencies between them, that's not scaled agile. You don't need huge frameworks and cost and um and certification in order to get that working well because they can work very well individually as teams where you have one single product that has 300 people working on it then you have a scaled agile problem that's sure. when you need those techniques so i would say just be slightly careful of of just choosing an approach and then getting people in to teach that approach to everybody at the end of the day it's really about the mindset and the culture it's really about truly empowering people to choose to make the right decisions and truly trusting that they will mm -hmm. those are really the big i think an agile transformation is much more around the mindset of the higher level management yeah. than it is around anything else you get that right you need that high level support you need somebody on at board level who utterly believes in this because otherwise you're just going to be doing bits and bats and yeah. you're never truly going to get that mindset change yeah well, that's a really good answer and then um we're, we're running short on time so we're going to move to the last couple of questions here um and i wanted to kind of um ask Tim, you you know your experience of the transition from private to public you've obviously seen uh, both sides and and you know are we facing similar challenges as a private sector organization and public sector or are the transformation changes and the digital um, challenges the same or, or are they slightly different? There's a lot of similarities. So, yeah. um, you know, obviously uh, getting technical staff. Now, uh, within the uh, public sector, there's, there's a salary limits which obviously uh, are more of a challenge although they're a challenge honestly in in the private sector also because it's only a certain amount you can pay before it becomes uneconomical mm -hmm. um but and and the scale of transformations in the yeah. public sector is huge yeah. in a way that i i don't know many private sector organizations that are at that level of transformation um but, you know, I think also the more you can get people to be uh, enthused about what they do. And I think in, in the public sector, you know, if I think about the systems that my um, guys provide, they're things that help you divorce online, probate online without having to use the solicitor although you still can and they use the same system sure. um these are not the best days in someone's life they're not used nobody i mean my previous role at sky people loved our products they loved them they would also tell us what they didn't love about them but they loved them no one is ever going to love the probate service yeah. it's just not the same thing but yeah. People use our services on days that are not the best day in their lives. Yeah. And and our aim is to make it for utterly forgettable for them. The best feedback for us is no feedback at all. Sure. Because then we have added zero stress. Yeah, seamless experience. Um, and then finally, um, and it's kind of a, a big kind of very good question, but what in your opinion should organisations be focusing on as priority in transformation over the next kind of six to 12 months as we recover um, and go hopefully beyond the pandemic? 
I think probably a number of the things that we've been talking around around ways of working, flexibility, yeah. trusting people, but also I think, you know, extending that out and beyond to everybody, you know, yeah. so, so all your customers want that as well. They only be able yeah. to do stuff remotely if they can, but have the option of not being remote. You know, that all of that type of optionality, um, the world, I believe, has fundamentally changed through this pandemic. We have the tools to cope with it for, for non-service jobs. And we've done so. And it's brought different expectations, it's brought different primacy to digital as a channel. Um, but really, those customers normally have huge amounts of choice mine don't yeah. <laughs> to be fair my, my services today are, are they don't really have a choice but to use them but you know mm. these people they have a choice they can go anywhere mm. i renewed my passport recently it was an amazingly good experience i can say yeah. there's nothing to it with my department amazingly yeah. great experience and so easy yeah compared to previous ones are doing it and that's what we need to be driving to is mm -hmm. um is that for all of our customers, but also for the people who work for us, for, yeah. you know, uh, to, to become that image of an organization where our work fits around our lives, mm -hmm. still of super importance, but mm -hmm. it fits around our lives. And therefore I want to work for that organization, all of those different aspects. Mm -hmm. and, and then just quickly with that, you say about, the that, that passport experience and has that been do you think down to more focus with the public sector on kind of on digital experiences over the last 12 months and kind of overhauling and moving away from not just legacy systems in place but also kind of legacy thinking so acting more you know um fluid and quickly and and obviously having to pivot quite quickly yeah, absolutely. There's been a real push across government. I mean, I don't know about that particular service. Sure. I don't know anyone who's worked on it, and I don't know. Um, uh, and but you know, there's a definite push across government to to really properly try to make these things easy, both for government as well as yeah. for um, for for the citizen or. or yeah or non-citizen, I have uh, immigration in my arena as well, so I have non-citizens as well as citizens. But um, but I think, you know, there's been a real push in that direction. Yeah. Um, and I think all for the great, all for the good, you know, yeah. um, as an individual, as a citizen of the country, my ability to go out there and for something like renewing my passport to take me such little time, mm. You know, I would have had to have gone queued for hours in the in the post office to have things done and gotten photos yeah. and done the, yeah. you know, and and it's such a different experience today. And it takes away all those chores that yeah. we've all had to do. And I think if digital's doing anything, it's doing that. It's to, it's making these things take less time, come more quickly, mm -hmm. not be chores, and you have other options of things to do with your life. Nice. Well, Louise, that's all we've got time for. Uh, as ever, it's been a real pleasure to to talk to you and to um, quickly cover some ground around your kind of your thinking and uh, much there on Agile again. And very much looking forward to hopefully having you back in 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 a physical um, manner and, and when we return our in person conferences in in the, you know the not so far distant future. So thanks for joining us and uh, and appreciate the time given as well the, the stresses of the, the week that you're having. Perfect. Thank you so much Chris. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.